Hi, my name is Magnar Nordahl. I'm an airline captain with interest in aviation history. I'm at the Royal Thai Air Force Museum in Bangkok, and this is a Boeing 100E. The history starts in 1928, when Boeing took the initiative to develop a new fighter for the US Navy. The result was a nimble double-decker powered by a Pratt & Whitney R1340 WASP radial engine, developing 425 horsepower. Two prototypes were built, and they were designed Model 83 and Model 89. The difference between them was the design of the landing gear. Model 83 has a spreadbar landing gear, and Model 89 had a split axle landing gear, providing space for a 500-pound bomb under the fuselage. In 1928, the first prototype won the National Air Races in Los Angeles with an average speed of 172 miles per hour over 120 miles course. This impressed the Chief of US Army Air Corps so much that he immediately placed an order for the airplane. It became the P-12. In all, 366 units were delivered to the Army in six versions. The final version was the P-12F. It had an upgraded WASP engine developing 600 horsepower. Shortly after, the US Navy placed an order for 27 aircraft. They were designated F4B-1, where F stands for fighter and B stands for Boeing. In other words, this is the fourth fighter aircraft built by Boeing for the Navy. Boeing delivered 187 units in four versions, from the Dash 1 to the Dash 4. And in 1931, the U.S. Marine Corps received 21 F-4B-4s. Furthermore, Boeing built another 33 units as prototypes and for export. Among them were some civil variants, and they were called Model 100. But the 100 designation is also used for the P-12 and the F-4B. Therefore, when someone is talking about the Boeing 100, it can be any of the versions. This little fighter was exported to Brazil, China, Philippines, Spain and Siam, which later changed the name to Thailand. The first variants have a fuselage made of square aluminium tubes. The forward part of the fuselage is covered by aluminium sheets, and from the cockpit it's covered by fabric. The landing gear is of split axle type, and at the rear there's a tail skid. The wings are of wood construction and covered by fabric. The upper wing is larger than the lower wing and is staggered. Only the upper wings have ailerons. From the control stick there's a push rod inside the lower wing to a belt crank, and from there there is a strut transforming the movement to the ailerons. The ailerons are tapered and covered with corrugated aluminium. The stabilizers, rudder and elevators are also covered by corrugated aluminium. Up front is a Pratt & Whitney R1340 WASP 9-cylinder air-cooled radial piston engine. The displacement is 1344 cubic inches or 22 liters. The engine has a single-stage centrifugal type compressor. The power output is from 425 to 600 horsepower, depending on the engine variant. This engine has been used in about 100 different aircraft types, including the T6 Texan, or Harvard as the British named it. The first airplanes had cooling fairings behind the cylinders. They may look cool, but it was soon discovered that the fairings reduced the cooling effect and therefore they were removed. And believe it or not, without the fairings, the cruise speed increased with 3 to 5 miles per hour. The propeller has variable pitch, but it can only be adjusted on the ground. With the exception of the civil variants, the fighter is equipped with two machine guns located in the top of the fuselage. In addition, the airplane can carry small bombs under the wings. The Boeing has a gross weight of 2,557 pounds, or 1,160 kilos. 
and the top speed for the first version was 168 miles per hour or 270 kilometers per hour. The F4B-2 and the P12C introduced a spreader bar between the landing wheels and a narrow cord cowling fitted around the cylinders. This cowling improved engine cooling and reduced the drag. The cowling is called a tone and ring after the inventor. The Navy variants also received a custering tailwheel. But the Army had to wait for the P12E model before they got the tailwheel. Furthermore, the ailerons were redesigned to be constant cord freeze ailerons. The freeze aileron has two benefits. It reduces the control force applied to the aileron, and it counteracts adverse yaw by increasing the drag on the wing moving down. The F4B-3 and P12E introduced an all-metal semi-monocoque airframe, but the wings remained the same. The F4B-4 and P12E introduced a larger tail fin to improve directional stability. The Navy models also received a larger hump behind the headrest. This gave space for a life raft. Many earlier models were retrofitted with those features. And finally, we have the P12F with a WASP engine delivering 600 horsepower. The fuel tank is located ahead of the cockpit and holds 55 US gallons. Some variants have a second fuel tank in the wing. And late variants could be equipped with an external tank under the fuselage. And this also had a capacity of 55 gallons. Pilots who flew this machine described the airplane as a fun machine. Steve McElroy, a former P-12 pilot, wrote, quote, The P-12 pilot used to be described as a man with an engine in his lap and a feather in his tail. In flight, the little airplane gave the pilot the impression that its taut stubby wings were firmly attached to his shoulders, a part of him. Most P-12 pilots whom I talk to can't remember ever deliberately moving the controls in flight. All that seemed to be necessary was the desire to initiate a maneuver, and the little ship would respond." End quote. Another pilot, Frank Tolman, described the P-12 as exciting. The takeoff roll is very short, and after getting airborne you can rise the nose to 40 degrees above the horizon and climb at 2,800 feet per minute. It can do basic aerobatics like roll, loop, cube and eight, and spin with ease. But it will only spin to the left. The only tricky part with this airplane is the landing. If the airplane starts to porpoise, you have to go around. Or you would, a second later, find yourself hanging upside down in your harness with the ground resting a couple of inches above your head. The airplane displayed at the Royal Thai Air Force Museum is a Model 100E. It's an unarmed export version of the P-12E. Only two units were built, and they were delivered to the Royal Siamese Air Service in 1931, where they were designated Fighter No. 7. The Royal Siamese Air Service used the 100E for evaluation together with two Heinkel HD-39 from Germany and two Bristol Bulldog from United Kingdom. The German fighter was never put into production, and many sources don't even mention that Siam had those airplanes. The Bulldog was one of the most famous fighter aircraft used by the Royal Air Force in the early 1930s. However, the Royal Siamese Air Service didn't select any of them. 
Instead, they purchased 12 Curtis Hawk II in 1934, and from 1935, they received more than 74 Curtis Hawk III, which was an export model of the BF2C1 Goshawk. The two model 100Es were later used as training planes here at Don Moang. One of them was written off during the Second World War, making this the only model 100E in existence today. Let's have a closer look at the model 100E. The length is 6.2 meters, the wingspan is 9.1 meters and the height is 2.7 meters. The gross weight is 1,220 kilos. The airplane is a traditional double-decker. The fuselage structure is semi-monocoque. The wings have a wooden structure covered by fabric. And the landing gear is fixed. The engine is a Wasp-17 developing 500 horsepower. Maximum speed is 189 miles per hour. Normal cruise speed is 160 miles per hour and the range is uh, 570 miles or 920 kilometers. This airplane is smaller than a Cessna 172, but it has three times the power. This, together with a large wing area, gives the Boeing a very good rate of climb, almost 3,000 feet per minute. But the drag factor is high, and at cruise, the Boeing is only 20 miles per hour faster than the Cessna. We will have a look at the cockpit later. On top of the fuselage, you can see the slot for the left machine gun. This airplane is unarmed, but it will be easy to install the guns. This is an opening where the spent cartridges were expelled.
Here is the belt crank for the aileron. You can notice that the strut is vertical, while the struts holding the wings together are slanted outwards. The ailerons are covered by corrugated aluminium. And here is the attach point for the aileron strut. The pitot tube is missing, it should be attached here. Um, there is a wasp in the nose, but there shouldn't be any nest here. I freeze the video here. This is the location of the fuel tank. It holds 55 US gallons. The firewall is here and it's made of aluminium. And the oil tank is here. The machine guns and the magazines are located here. Here is an interesting detail. This is the air intake to the carburetor. And this valve, which is controlled from the cockpit, directs hot exhaust from two of the cylinders into a smaller tube extending all the way to the other side. This arrangement heats the air around the tube and prevents icing in the carburetor. This is the air intake to the oil cooler. The outlet is on the other side.
This is a hollow tube and you can insert a steel rod which is used as a handhold when you want to move the airplane around. The tailplane is covered by corrugated aluminum. The stabilizer is attached to the fuselage to a point ahead of the elevator. The leading edge of the stabilizer moves up and down when the pilot operates the pitch stream. The stabilizers on modern airliners, like the Boeing 737, are trimmed in the same way. This is the location of the aft navigation light. Apparently the light bulb is missing. This airplane has a tail skid, which is preferred when operating on a soft surface. This is the Venturi tube, which provides vacuum to the turn and bank indicator. And this is where the spent cartridges from the right machine gun are expelled. I don't know the function of this opening, but it appears to be related to the machine gun as well. The fuel filler cap is under this panel and the oil filler cap is under this panel. Here is the outlet for the oil cooler. And this is the outlet for the carburetor heater. The exhaust stacks are very short. You can in fact see the exhaust valves in there. And those stacks are the intake manifolds. Airplanes like this were started in an inertia starter. It has the benefit that it doesn't need electrical power. Instead, you use muscle power. The starting process is very simple. You attach a hand crank here and start to crank like crazy. This causes a heavy flywheel to spin. When you are exhausted, you remove the hand crank and pull this lever. This engages a clutch that connects the spinning flywheel to the crankshaft of the engine and it starts to rotate. And hopefully the engine will start. This video shows how it's done in a Boeing Stearman PT-17.
Okay, ready? Yeah. This is the cockpit of a P12E. Model 100E is identical, with the exception that the machine guns are missing. Here is a 30 caliber Browning machine gun. The empty space here will hold either another 30 caliber or a 50 caliber machine gun. The instrument panel is straightforward. On the top, we have the flight instruments airspeed indicator, turn and bank indicator, and altimeter. Below there is a clock. The engine instruments are RPM, oil temperature, oil pressure and fuel pressure. On the left side we have the magneto switch. This lever is labeled starter. Surely it has something to do with the engine start but I don't know more than that. If you know something I don't know please let us know in the comments below. Next, we have the throttle quadrant with the throttle lever and mixture lever. Behind is a red lever for bomb release. This is the fuel selector. It has four positions, off, auxiliary, main and reserve. The auxiliary tank is the extra tank that can be attached under the fuselage. The reserve tank is the lowest section of the main tank. This is a pitch trim hand crank and indicator. This lever has no label and I have no idea what it is. If I had to guess, I would say it controls the carburetor heat. And below is a lever labeled pump. This is most probably a manual fuel pump used to pressurize the fuel system before engine start. When the engine is running, the fuel is supplied by an engine driven fuel pump. To the left of the seat is a map holder. They even have a pencil here. In the front is the control stick and the rudder pedals. The wheel brakes are activated by pressing the upper part of the pedals. And on the right side we have a hand crank labeled booster. It is used to activate a booster magneto or booster coil. This produces a strong spark during engine start, which means the pilot has to crank this lever as fast as he can. And this long glass tube is the fuel indicator. The fuel tank is here, and the fuel indicator shows the level with the help of gravity alone. Simple and effective. This lever is labeled open and closed. Below is an engraving that might read a shutter. In that case, then the lever is used to control the opening of the shutter in the nose bowl. This is used to control the oil temperature. Here are two light switches. And here is another mystery lever. It acts on a push rod and can apparently be locked in different positions. Next we have a lever marked fuel gauge. This is the fuel indicator. The lever has three positions, on, off and drain. Apparently there is a fuel drain in the line between the fuel tank and the fuel indicator. And below here is a lever for the parking brake. And this concludes the cockpit guide. If you like this video, you know what to do. Thank you for watching, have a wonderful day and happy learning!